uh, computer architecture for the IB computer science exam. Um, and it's going to be a short video just reviewing the specifics of that section of the curriculum. So I'm going to go to uh, page 21 of the curriculum. And we're going to take a look specifically on page 21 at this section here under computer organization called computer architecture. So it starts here on page 21 of the curriculum and then it goes on to page 22. I'm also going to cover this section on secondary memory, but I'm not going to cover this section on operating systems and application systems. So what I did is I took all these little points from the curriculum and I've transferred them over to here. So these are the main points that you need to know for the IB curriculum in this section. So let me just quickly read them. We're going to read them here at the beginning and then quickly at the end. Outline the architecture of the central processing unit, CPU, and the functions of the arithmetic logic unit, ALU, and the control unit, CU, and the registers within the CPU. On a side note, students should be able to reproduce a block diagram showing the relationship between elements of the CPU, input, output, storage, memory address register, memory data register, and those are what needs to be included. It also says describe primary memory, distinguish between random access memory, RAM, and read-only memory, ROM, and their use in primary memory. Also, I'm going to explain the use of cache memory. Students should be able to explain the effect of cache memory in speeding up the system, as well as being able to explain how it is used. I'm also going to explain something called the machine instruction cycle. This should be include the role of the data bus and the address bus. And finally, identify the need for persistent storage. Persistent storage is needed to store data in a non-volatile device during and after the running of a program. So what I also did is made a list of the terms that I just talked about. So these are those terms, CPU, that's an acronym, ALU, CU, registers, MAR, MDR, primary memory, cache, machine instruction cycle, data bus, address bus, persistent storage, and volatile versus non-volatile. Let's get started. So the first thing you need to know about architecture is that there are two ways that architecture can be designed a simple way or a complex way. And what I mean by that is the simple system would just use two states, like yes, no, on, off, true, false. A multiple state system would have a variety of different answers, like yes, no, maybe. True, false, could be true, okay? Could be false. A two state system understands very few instructions because there's only two states that it can accomplish. But a complex system can understand multiple different instructions. In an architecture stance, this is called a RISC versus CISC architecture. That's an acronym that stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computer or Complex Instruction Set Computer. The way I've shown you here in this diagram, clearly most computer systems use a RISC architecture because it works better when things are simple in a two-state system. So, if we have the two-state on-off binary system, a dual or duality system, we need our hardware able to work with this. So this means our hard drives, our memory, our RAM, our ROM, all of that works with the two-state on-off system. Instructions, your code, is written and then translated into this two-state system executed by the hardware or run by the hardware along with the data that the code might need. So for example, you have a game, but the game needs your high score. The game is the instructions, the high score is the data, and all of that is incorporated into the two-state system. The hardware side needs to accomplish the two-state system, fetch the instructions from memory, execute the instructions, and it needs to keep doing this over and over again cyclically or in a cycle. The two-state system also needs a way to represent the data. Okay, we're not going to cover that today, but for example, numbers need to be turned into on, off, or true, false. Words, pictures, videos, etc., all need to be turned into the two-state system. Okay, the first piece of hardware we're going to look at is something called the CPU, which stands for the central or main processing unit. So the word central implies it's the main unit that does the processing, which is what we were just talking about. The central processing unit needs to talk to memory. 
It needs to, that's where all the data is stored. So it takes the data from memory and processes it. That's the simplest way I can explain it. Let's go further. The CPU is broken into two main components, an ALU and a CU. So the CPU itself communicates with memory, but the CPU has two internal pieces, the ALU and the CU. The ALU stands for the arithmetic logic unit. Arithmetic or arithmetic, okay, is what performs the actual math on the two-state system. To the computer, everything is numbers, two numbers, and it needs to do math on those two numbers. And so those two numbers we know are binary numbers, and so the arithmetic logic unit does all the math. It's basically a giant calculator doing all the calculations. The CU stands for the control unit. This is the unit that is more in control of the system. It controls the cycle of instructions and the operations as well as how the data flows through the system. So the control unit controls it. The arithmetic unit does the math. That's both part of the CPU. So the CPU consists of the processing units, the arithmetic and the control unit that communicates with memory through something called a bus or buses in this case. In other words, directing the data to and from memory to the processing units. Now, let's talk about memory. Memory, obviously, is where we store our data. Data, obviously, can be lots of different things. But if we think deeper, data is actually two things. Data consists of the actual data and an address telling you where in memory it's located. This can be simply described like this, right? When you get mail, that's your data. That's the thing you wanted in the mail. But in order to find your mail, you had to go to the address of your mailbox. And a delivery, someone who's delivering the mail, needs to know the address of where the data is going. So it's very simply two components, the address and the data itself. We actually saw this when we looked at code. When we look deeper into code, things like int a equals 10 or array b equals 10, 20, 30, we talked about how that was actually two pieces. The data itself, the contents, and then the memory location needs an address, which was the name of the variable or the name of the identifier name. So we saw this in code. Now we're seeing it in the hardware. All right, let's take memory and break it up a little bit further. When we're talking about memory, we're talking about both primary memory and secondary memory, okay? Primary just means, I mean, just like the word itself, it implies it's the more important. It's the closest, it's the fastest, etc. Secondary is what happens once the primary is full, it has to overflow into secondary memory. So primary memory is located right beside the CPU, as close as possible, because it needs it immediately. Okay? Sometimes it's called the cache memory. Okay? It's one use of that word cache, is that it's right next to the CPU so it can use it immediately or in a primary state. Secondary, where it overflows, would include things like RAM, ROM, the hard drive, etc. Secondary is a very broad term to describe all the memory where it overflows outside the CPU. So, let's take a look at it now. Our CPU which consists of an ALU and a CU, arithmetic logic and control unit, connects through a bus to primary memory or cache. Primary memory, when it overflows, goes to secondary memory. All right, let's go further. The primary memory is sometimes called the immediate access storage. Immediate because it's right there. It needs it immediately. It's primary, okay? It's what needs to hold the data so that it can do instructions immediately. Secondary memory is a blanket term, as I said. It could consist of RAM, ROM, or what's called persistent storage, like a hard drive or a flash drive or something like that, that is technically called virtual memory. And again, we're bussing our data back and forth between these devices. Let's take a look at RAM and ROM for one second. RAM is a piece of memory, random access memory, which is constantly being read from and, or sorry, read to or written to and read from, constantly being erased and reused all the time. RAM is 
non-permanent. It doesn't maintain its memory permanently. So it's technically called volatile memory. This is because if all of a sudden the power goes out, RAM is erased. Okay, that's like you'll lose your place in the game if the power is turned off because it won't remember its spot. ROM is a more permanent memory. It can only be read from. You can't write to ROM. That's why it's called read-only memory. Okay? It is considered non-volatile memory because it will maintain its instructions even after the power goes turned off. All right, so now we have RAM and ROM. We fit that into our large diagram now. So the CPU, consisting of the ALU, the CU, buses data from the immediate access storage in primary memory, which buses data from secondary memory, which could include RAM, ROM, or persistent storage, virtual memory. Okay, that's a bigger diagram. Let's talk about busing for a second. Busing is the transfer of data around in this system. So a bus is a transfer line of data. Simply, you could think of it as a wire of data that's wiring the data from one spot to another. Also, you'll hear the term register. A register is another name for memory. It's the location spot in memory or the storage spot. So we can have a bus that transfers the data from one spot to another along the system. And we can also have a bus that transfers addresses along the system. And these are usually two different buses, an address bus and a data bus. And we already talked about the difference. The address, like in the picture with the mailbox, is the address on the mailbox. And the data is the actual letters or the, the specific data that's being transferred. So we can have both of them happening at once. Similarly, inside of memory, inside of the registers, we can have a memory data register, which remembers the next important piece of data the CPU needs, and a memory address register, which remembers the next important memory address that the CPU needs to do. Both are important. Both are connected, the address and the data, but we have different buses and different registers for each one. Once we have the hardware set up, we then can form what's called a machine instruction cycle. This is how the computer runs every single second or microsecond or nanosecond or picosecond every time it's running its information. Here's the cycle. One, it fetches data or an instruction from the memory, from the immediate access storage in the memory. So it says, give me the instruction I got to do. Two, it decodes that information. It goes, well, what am I supposed to do with this instruction? So it figures out what it needs to do. Three, it executes it. It goes, okay, I will do your instruction. It executes your execution. Now, again, you can see here the decoding is often done by the control unit. The execution is done by the arithmetic logic unit. That makes sense. These are specific pieces of hardware for specific tasks. Once it executes, so for example, Let's, let's do a simple example. The example is x plus y. That's our instruction. So this moves over, once it has this instruction, which it pulls out of memory, and it goes over and it decodes it. Oh, I have to do addition, okay? It might need to go back and fetch a little more data, like what is the value of x? So x is a two and y is a three, okay? So now it moves the instruction and the data along, okay? Because the data is coming through the data bus and being stored by the memory data register. Whoops, that should be a D. Okay. The address, okay, is moving through the address bus and the memory address register. Okay, so now it's got the instruction, 2 plus 3, it knows what to do. It's obviously going to generate a result. That result, 5, is then stored. So the next step along the cycle, fetch the instruction, decode it, execute it, store it. Where does it store it? Why, back in memory, back in immediate access storage. And then it goes on and goes to the next one. So if you imagine this like lines of code in your code that you write, this is what's happening as it moves through that system, the machine 
instruction cycle. If we go back to the diagram, we can see this in the diagram as well. So in the diagram, here's our code, x plus y. The data in that code is 2 plus 3. This code could be stored over on a hard drive, over here in persistent storage. But as you go to run your code, it moves out of the hard drive, over into RAM, and eventually up into the immediate access area. Same with the data. It's also going to move along up into there. So then the machine instruction cycle says, go fetch that next instruction. So the control unit says, fetch it. So it fetches the instruction. It says, oh, wait a minute, you also need some data. So it fetches the data. Then it moves to the next stage ex uh, to execute it. To execute it, it now goes and moves it over to the ALU and says, OK, I need you to perform this task. I need you to generate a result. So the arithmetic unit generates the result. The result is then used by the control unit to move it back here, which might eventually make its way all the way back to show up on your screen when you run your code and it outputs to you what the result is. That's my quick summary of this from step by step. And I'm going to go all the way back now to the first sections at the beginning to review what it says in the IB curriculum. Starting with this list. The CPU, the Central Processing Unit. The ALU, the Arithmetic Logic Unit. The CU, the Control Unit. Registers, memory. M memory address register, a piece of memory that remembers an address. Memory data register, a memory register that remembers a piece of data. Primary memory, the important memory that's close to the CPU. You can combine that with secondary memory, not in the list here, which is memory that's not on the CPU, which is used when the primary memory overflows. Cache is primary memory. It's important, that's imp memory that's important. The machine instruction cycle, fetch, decode, execute, store. The data bus, the bus is electronic wiring that, can, that transfers data around. Address bus, same thing, electronic wiring that, that moves addresses along. Persistent storage, storage that stays around persistently, which is non-volatile, which means it doesn't rely on power. Volatile is like RAM. It can be erased, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of this information now, if we transfer back to here, outline the architecture of the CPU, the functions of the ALU, and the control unit and registers within the CPU. I feel you can do that, OK? You should be able to draw some form of a block diagram. It could be a complicated block diagram, like, say, this one. Whoops. This one. Or a simpler block diagram like say this one, but it's still a block diagram. And it explains either through the diagram or through your words, if we go back to that point, the functions of the CPU, ALU, CU, along with memory. You should be able to describe that primary memory and the difference between RAM and ROM. You should be explained what cache memory, and that, as it says here, if we increase the amount of cache, primary memory, so that the computer doesn't have to keep going all the way down to secondary memory, that's going to make things go faster. The machine instruction cycle we talked about, and the need for persistent or non-volatile storage. And that, kids, is my review of computer architecture for the IB computer science exam. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button if you liked what you saw.